Yeah, good evening all, and welcome to this first session, which is coming up from Pan IIT. And we have a very esteemed guest, Swami Smaran Anandji, today with us. And he will have a talk and also it will take us through a guided meditation. I have a few slides which I will share before we welcome him on to talk to us and share his thoughts. Ranu. So we started with uh, Pan IIT with coming together of all the IITians. The whole idea has been to look at innovation and accelerating the innovation. We're also looking at engaging and supporting all the IITs. And additionally, as the things are changing in India and we see global globally as well, it has been important <coughs> to promote entrepreneurship among the alumni. At the same time, it is important to collaborate, collaborate with all the stakeholders, and this includes the alumni themselves, includes the government, it includes the industry, and also includes the investors. And the whole mission, what all Pan IIT and our members have looked at, that we will continue to drive innovation. We'll continue to work with research and building things. And among the new things that are coming up, is to look at and taking care of climate. As part of run up to today, we have the team which has been working behind. We have had uh, Nirmal Anandji from Yogoda Foundation itself who has been supporting us. From our own team, we have Padmini who is managing the office and uh, been doing all work that is required to organize and set up today. We have Smita who initiated this whole conversation because she has been a Yogoda member. She is um, IS officer and been chief secretary of the state and uh, she uh, graduated in from IIT Delhi. And I'm here for the welcome. I'm also general secretary for Pan IIT and I am from IIT Kanpur. Sunilji who is with us here today, he'll be moderating the session later. And uh, he's from IIT Bhatshu, but he also did his post-graduation from IIT Kanpur. And we have Debashish, who will conclude it with a vote of thanks. He's also chairman of Pan IIT. And now we have to meet the speaker and our guru today, Swami Smar Anandji. He's a VP Yogoda Society of India. He's also a distinguished alum from IIT Kharagpur. Swami Smaranandji is a sannyasi of Yogoda Satsang Society of India, founded by Paramahans Yoganandji in 1917. This society is involved in various spiritual, humanitarian, and charitable activities, and in the spread of Kriya Yoga teaching of Paramahans Yoganandji in the Indian subcontinent. Swami Smaranandji is a postdoctorate fellow from Concordia University, Canada and a PhD in Electronics and Communication Engineering from IIT Kharagpur. He's also been a gold medalist in school final and engine engineering. Swami Smaranandji has worked in many universities and in industry before joining Satsang Society as a sannyasi in 1985. In 1985, he had an option, but Swami Yoganandji uh, took over the option to work in Yodoga Satsang Ashram over as an opportunity to work with the late president then Abdul Kalam. He has delivered many <coughs> TEDx talks and has been regularly covered by television channels. With this, now I would like to welcome Swami Smaran Anandji. Welcome Swamiji. Thank you, Pradeep. Love and greetings to each one of you. Today's topic is the importance of meditation. Taitriya Upanishad says, from joy I have come, for joy I live, and in that sacred joy, one day I shall melt again. In a world of duality, 
where we see so much pain and suffering all around us, such a statement may sound unrealistic. Isn't it so? Is it possible that I have come from joy, I can live in a perpetual joy, when so much is going around me and in me? We may not fully grasp the import of such a statement, but the words of an Upanishad cannot go wrong. If only we practice the principles well mapped out by ancient seers, rishis, we will watch for the veracity of such, state, such a statement. It is possible to live in perpetual joy, no matter what's happening around me, no matter what's happening to me, I can still be joyful inside. That is, that's possible, we'll come to that. In Bhagavad Gita, Bhagavan Krishna says, Svalpam afyasya dharmasya trayate mahato bhayat, meaning, even a little practice of this yoga will save you from dire fears. Even a little practice of this yoga meditation will save you from dire fears. Gita doesn't say that if you practice yoga meditation, you will be free from problems, challenges, difficulties. No. But the fears that come out of them, the challenges, difficulties, that can be conquered. We may not have control over the events in our life, but at least we can live a life free from fear. It seems that as long as one has life, what is guaranteed is anxiety. If you analyze, it appears so. Whether it's a boy of 10 year old going for the exam, or a 20 year old youth, a 30 year old housewife, or a 40 year old employee, or a retired person, what next? What next? Anxiety. What is going to happen? That seems to be a part of our lives. This anxiety can be conquered by practice of yoga meditation. As a result, one can be calmly active and actually calm, sitting on the throne of poise and directing his kingdom of activities. It's possible to be active, but calmly active. I mean, that is the goal of your... I would like to share with you a short story. One person had a lot of difficulties, mainly financial problems and other problems that come out of these financial issues. He tried and tried, somehow he couldn't get over. One day, in his dream, Lord appeared to him and advised him to go to the outskirts of the town and meet a sadhu and he would give a diamond and that would solve his problems. He believed in his dream. Next day morning, before the sun came up, he rushed to the outskirts. There he found a sadhu sitting, and, sitting somewhere there. Then he rushed to him and said, Diamond, diamond, diamond. Sadhu could not understand because Sadhu did not have the dream. He had the dream. He said, what? Then he explained, I would like to collect the dream as per the advice of God himself. Then the Sadhu said, yeah, I know. A few weeks back when I was moving in the forest, I found the diamond. This is what probably you were referring to. He took his diamond out of his bag and gave it to him. Take it. That diamond was so huge 
very rare, invaluable, that would solve all his problems and the problems of his children and their children. It is so valuable in one shot. He was extremely happy. He went home. That night he couldn't sleep. He was tossing around on his bed. Next morning, again he rushed back to Sadhu and returned diamond to him. Please take it. He said, no, why? Why are you giving it? God asked you to take it. And I have given it to you wholeheartedly. Why are you returning it? No, no, take it. Why? Then he said, there must be something in you by which you are able to give away this diamond so easily. I want that, that something. So the logic he used is, if you, if you donate 100 rupees, you must be having more than 100 rupees with you. So there is something more valuable than this diamond. In you, that's what I want. Because the diamond is useful even for a, even for a sadhu. Health insurance, material prosperity, social status, whatever. But he gave away so easily. That, what is that he had? That's inner security. Inner security. That is what we are all looking for. No matter what's happening, still we feel secured. We are calmly active, going about our duties and responsibilities. Another example I will let quote is this. If you have temperature, you see a doctor. Doctor normally gives a paracetamol. If you take it, six hourly, eight hourly, whatever, temperature goes down. But is it all what the doctor gives you? Because this Paracetamol only reduces the temperature. But doctor also gives generally antibiotic. Because antibiotic is required to remove the bacteria that has caused this temperature. Just having symptomatic relief with the paracetamol doesn't cure me. The temperature would come again until the bacteria is removed. That is that's why we, I take antibiotic too with paracetamol. So here is the analogy. I have here a problem, financial problem. I have a family problem. I have professional problem. I have social issue. I have many problems in life. Trying to remove the financial problem, it may come up again. Or this may be resolved, but this family problem still stays there. Our professional issue is still there. There are so many problems, relationships. Now find out the root cause of these problems, why these problems are coming up and remove that root cause. Find the bacteria and remove that. Rather than having symptomatic relief, removing the challenges temporarily. What is the cause of these external problems? That is ignorance, agnyan. What is ignorance? Ignorance of divinity within the highest potential. I am potentially divine. I have that infinite potential, infinite joy, infinite love is in me. I am not getting connected with that. I am living ignorant of my real infinite potential. That's why I'm having to face all these problems as a mere mortal being. Let me put it this way. I have this body, I have to take care of this body by right food, right exercise, etc. When I take care of this body, in turn, body gives me health and mobility. I also have a mind. I have to nurture my mind too. How do I do that? By intellectual pursuits, positive thinking. When I cultivate my mind properly, then in turn, mind gives me intelligence, ability to get along with others. That intelligence comes from my mind, not from my body. Many people do that. They take care of their bodies, they take care of their minds. But man is of threefold nature. I have a body, I have a mind, and I also have a soul. I have a soul. And I have to 
nurture my soul to the food for my soul is meditation deep contemplation when i properly take care of my soul in turn it gives me intuition unconditional joy perfect love and in creativity the creativity and intuitions they don't come from mind or body it comes from soul so we have to take care of soul too so there must be balanced development of body mind and soul to live a happy and healthy life as we know how to take care of body and mind we must also know how to take care of our souls and nurture it that's where meditation plays an important role to take care of the soul give the right food to soul here i would like to take a short digression and address one question what is god god is a term we have been hearing from childhood a concept probably we are asked to believe but did you ever stop and contemplate what is this there are many many books written on god many lectures spoken all of them are right in their own right but for me personally the definition of god that is closest to my heart is this god is sachidanand god is sachidanand that's the best definition i like what is it what does it mean sachidanand again we should understand what is sachidanand a term we have been hearing from childhood let me explain this now i have no concept of god but but whether god is he or she or it whatever if there is some entity like god can that god be sorrowful even if we don't know much about it we are not making any mistake by starting with that assumption that god is joy god is anand but to say god is joy is a grass grass understatement god is not simple joy like i i'm familiar with joy you know i am joyful when i take some nice food and meet some nice person or hear some good news i am joyful but this joy is different this is even new joy nitya navin anand god is even new joy nitya navin anand it's like this no if i take a mango that gives me some happiness a second mango gives me further joy but third doesn't give the same happiness fourth i don't want to take because the theory of diminishing returns theory of marginal utility this applies not only to mangoes or food items this applies to every experience in life imagine there are many things which we liked once twice thrice four times slowly 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 it fades there is one thing in this creation which never fades that is god's joy contact that comes out of god that is ever new we can no one can exhaust it it is inexhaustible even new joy god is even new joy god is anand okay god may be even new joy but what good it is if he is not aware of this god is ever conscious of his even new joy he is always aware of that that consciousness means chit god is chidanand ever conscious even new joy but what good it is if it exists only for a little while and then absent so for me i can think of the events between my life and my death but god is god was and god will be god is ever existing god is ever existing that ever existing is truth sat 
that is what god is sat chit anand ever existing ever conscious ever new joy that is god but i won't stop here when i talk about god define about god my full definition is this god is sachidanand and aham brahmasmi you must have heard this statement aham brahmasmi is not my statement all scriptures proclaim it all religions declare it aham brahmasmi meaning i am god i am a part of god i am a, an ex, i am an expression of that same divinity so potentially i am ever existing ever conscious ever new <coughs> joy because that is what i am i am means every individual in this creation everyone is a part of that joy potentially we only have to improve our knowledge of this more importantly we have to improve our experience of this that joy that joy in sleep we are joyful when we have deep sleep how is it coming because potentially it is there that that peace is there inside that joy is there but in sleep is unconscious but where that can be experienced in consciously that ever new joy no matter what's happening around me no matter what's happening to me i can be joyful while being active in this world participating but in that that platform is there from there i operate before moving further i would like to describe this joy a little bit <clears throat> because joy is not something unknown to us we we say we are we are blissful we are joyful we are very pleasant we are happy but this joy of god contact that we find in meditation is so different to explain this i would put it this way it has three shades this joy has three shades it is physiological psychological and spiritual physiological in the sense that if i take a mango my taste birds get excited taste birds and then i am automatically happy no one is to tell me that you took a mango be happy no one is to tell the very action of taking mango makes me physiologically something happens here physiologically i am happy same thing if we meditate if we contact that inner source body feels light and you you feel automatically physiologically there are changes at brain cells whole body there are and automatically you become you enjoy that that bliss and the joy also psychological see for me to be happy i don't have to necessarily take a mango or a sweet or any anything i am sitting here if i get some good news something happened to my family or my to country or to my company something happened good good something good happened immediately i feel psychologically so elated that happens after meditation you feel elated all will be well everything will be taken care i mean that 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 psychologically you feel uplifted and third one this is most important for me to explain this i would like to quote something from the words of param shogananand ji he is the author of this book whom i follow um, autobiography of yogi this book some of you may have seen it this available in more than 50 languages in the world it is available in 14 indian languages including sanskrit urdu punjabi english telugu i mean telugu tamil all 14 languages of india he said when bliss comes over you you recognize it as a conscious intelligent universal being to whom you may appeal and not an abstract mental concept mark his words what he meant is when the joy comes over you in meditation you recognize that joy as a conscious intelligent universal being to whom you may appeal meaning that hap- that joy we get out of meditation is so different from the other type of joys we are familiar with this joy comes with a sense of higher presence 
samsa yes a conscious intelligent universal being to whom we may appeal some some higher presence it doesn't mean that one sees a, a venerable person is there with four heads and eight hands sitting on a throne if someone sees it, it's okay i have no issue with that but it's not doesn't happen that way generally it comes the sense of higher presence that conviction convincing to very core of your being some higher presence i mean that's it that is where the healing comes from that is where that conviction that joy is, is an experience it's an experience to the very core of our beings if we do scientifically the proper meditation that's a result no one has to taste it i am sure everyone is eligible for that if only we try so that's why i'm just trying to put in the words so the joy of meditation joy of god contact that the contact our own real inner source is so beautiful it is physiological psychological and more important is spiritual that that one now we understand the the truth declared by taitreya upanishad from joy i have come for joy i live in that sacred joy one day i shall melt again so it it's it's always that bliss because we are that we are that we are that imagine that sleep where we unconsciously experience that relaxation this much 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 deeper actually we we experience that so that's about just a trying to put in words what we can really experience about uh, merit uh, joy of god contact in meditation here it doesn't depend on any faith you only have to believe in your own existence that sun there is something inside that is all okay now we understand why saints are so joyful that we know many saints in all religions no take a mirabai sakubai or saint ignatius augustine when they are in touch with that divine source they are so joyful in spite of the problems around them some of them face much more serious problems which you and i are ever facing but still they are able to manage because of that contact within themselves that of the inner source okay i'll give a few mundane examples to quote to explain this point at iit kharagpur one of our core research scholars finished his phd thesis and he was appearing for the defense the final viva afterwards he would be given the degree we were all waiting there in the seminar hall about maybe 50 60 of us the excellent exam- examiner was professor b nag later he was uh, the director of iit bombay he came he came a little late we were all waiting there as soon as he came he asked our head of the department professor sarap where is the candidate you want to just see the candidate before starting the viva so he was, he was introduced here is a candidate as soon as he saw the candidate professor b nag just stepped back like this you you appear so relaxed as if the exam is already over look at this an external examiner commenting this you appear so relaxed as if exam exam is already over this person after after the exam he said that where was the need for to be anxious i am relaxed this person was meditating practicing kriya yoga for more than a year by then he said i have been i have prepared for my exam i am ready ready to defend my thesis otherwise exam means what tap 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 heart should be beating fast that is that either it is exam of class 10 board exam or phd viva or something else something else or even a presentation in the office or something some anxious anxiety must be there we are so used to that but it's possible to be relaxed i am prepared but no need to be anxious anymore 
Don't you want to be like that? Here is the key. Meditation. I have the story of an IAS officer. He was in Patna at that time. He used to regularly meditate morning, evening. And his colleagues knew that. And they asked him, we don't understand how do you work by spending so much time in meditation? Because IAS officers, they are being public servants, they have so much pressure all the time. All the time they are on duty. We don't understand how do you work by spending so much time in meditation? He replied like this. I don't understand how do you work without spending so much time in meditation? Because meditation is the one which is giving me that required strength. A sense of relief, the platform of calmness to fulfill my duties. No. For a short while, I worked at HAL, Hindustan Aeronautics at Hyderabad. There, no, we used to have weekend off. Then Monday, when Monday we're when we're going for work, many of us. No, would say, oh, again Monday. Because weekend, they spend time in meetings and parties and outings and this and that, etc., movies, this, that. They are so tired, Monday, again Monday. Because next drudgery, next five and a half days. But one of us would say, now Monday. Very enthusiastic. Now you would spend a little more in meditation on weekend, family time, etc., and he's ready the battle of daily life. I mean, that it gives that. It gives that. One more example I can quote is this. Once a Mahant, Mahant means head of an ashram, he passed away. There was a function in that connection. The visitors asked the Mahant's disciples, what was it to which your master gave maximum importance while he was alive. What was it to which he gave maximum importance while he was alive? One disciple answered, My master gave maximum importance to whatever he was doing at that particular point. When he was talking to a person, that person is most important thing in, in, in this creation, so full attention. When he was reading a book, nothing else matters, complete focus on the book. While he was eating, he would focus that energy going in, Annam Parabrahma Swarupam, he would take it. And whatever he is doing, he would focus. And then shift focus. A result of regular meditation. It's not that we neglect our duties. We focus one by one, one by one, not multiplexing all the time and take it up. So it is possible, it's possible to fulfill all our duties with a sense of calmness, being actively calm and calmly active. Okay. We all want happiness, no matter what we do in this life, what, what, whatever we are doing, we want to be happy. Where do we find that joy? Where do we find that joy? Here is an analogy. Grandmother was doing some embroidery work. She was stitching something. Then by mistake, the, she dropped the needle. It fell down. Then she started searching for the needle. It is so thin and it wasn't brightly lit, that area. She, she couldn't find the needle. Then someone advised, what are you doing? So I'm searching for the needle. You have to search in light. Then she promptly went outside the home, then started searching for the needle under a street light. Then someone else asked, what are you doing? I'm searching for the needle. Where did you lose it? I lost it inside. But why are you searching outside? Because there is no light inside. 
she misses, misunderstood the advice. Bring the light inside and search, not search outside. There is an analogy here. Where did we lose that contact with joy? Where is that joy, inner joy? Unconditional, which doesn't depend on any conditions and any objects. In, in joy is there because I, I am owner of it. I lost it inside, but where I am searching? Out there, in that possession, in that position, in that relation, in that, in that, here, there, only, if only that happens, I will be happy. There, I am going to be joyful. There, always, in that. There is nothing wrong in this objective outside. Yes, we enjoy. There is so much happiness in that, from that position, from this position, from this relationship, from this achievement, from this work. That's perfectly all right. But the ultimate joy cannot depend on these things. In addition to that, not in place of that, in addition to these things, we should have that joy inside. So in that case, we can say, no matter what's happening around me, no matter what's happening to me, I can still be joyful. In addition to these external achievements. So that, otherwise we are searching for the needle, last needle in a wrong place. So let's be careful about it. Now, little bit about uh, uh, meditation. See, once a person approached a saint and put him a question. See, I am very busy, very active in life. I don't have much time. Please tell me what is God in one sentence. I don't need lectures. Tell me what is God in one sentence. The saint answered, why one sentence? One word will do. What? Yes. What is that? Silence. What? God is silence. Yes, silence. What is silence? Meditation. How do you meditate? In silence. How do you get that silence? By meditation. Here, the saint used these three words, God, silence, meditation, as if they refer to the same thing, which is true. In the highest sense, the silence which the saint is referring to is not the mere silence of vocal cords. <coughs> vocal cords have to be silent. Thoughts have to be silent. Emotions have to be silent. Anxieties have to be silent. Fears have to be silent. Eyes have to be silent. Ears have to be silent. Skin has to be silent. All senses have to be silent. Imagine a state where I am free from, my, from the sensations coming from eyes, ears, nose, etc. No sensation from outside world. And thoughts are absent. Emotions are not there. Anxieties are not there. Where am I? Aham Brahmasmi. I am with my real self which is ever new joy, Satchidanan. That is ever new joy. I am there. That is where I experience God. The word silence is used here. For me personally, a better word is stillness. Still. Stillness. Nischel. That is, that is where we experience that real silence, which is our real nature, joy. It's full of joy and full of love. Wisdom. Now, we say that the divinity is in me, that God's reflection is in me, that, that divinity is in me, no doubt. If, it is, if, if God's reflection is in me, the divinity, why can't I perceive that? The classical example given in spiritual literature is this. If you want to see the reflection of moon and a lake, the lake has to be still. If lake is ruffled, the reflection cannot be seen, even if you see it is distorted. Similarly, the reflection of divinity is in me, that creation. The creator is in me. But I can't pursue because the lake of my mind, the lake of my consciousness are always disturbed, always, never still, never still. Meditation 
there is a scientific technique which stills the waves of thoughts, consciousness, the ripples are, that are there in the thoughts and consciousness, they are stabilized. That is where, that is where meditation comes into play. That helps us. It stabilizes the thoughts. It subdues, we can say that. It subdues the thoughts. It subdues the sensations. Now, is it possible a state where my eyes are subdued, ears are subdued, skin is subdued, they don't bring any sensation from outside world, is it possible? Yes. Sleep. In sleep, I don't hear sounds. I'm not deaf, but temporarily so. I'm not disturbed. Even a mosquito lands on my body, I may not feel, because sense of touch is taken away at that time. No doubt I am free from sensations, but unfortunately my mind is not in my control, subconsciousness. You can imagine that meditation is in a way, loosely speaking, conscious sleep. That means the sensations won't be there, but consciousness is alive. No? That can be put on something higher, higher pursuits. That is meditation. Consciousness is alive. But sensations are thoughts and anxieties, they are subdued. Now, one principle I can quote is this. Uh, we all want to have mind control. But the more, more we want to control our mind, the more it disturbs us. Thoughts are never under control. Thoughts go again and again. Even sleep sometimes thoughts keep running. But our ancient rishis are real spiritual scientists. By experimentation over centuries, they found one fundamental truth that mind and breath are interrelated. We, if we cannot control mind directly, we can get control of the mind by some control of the breath. They are interrelated. And this is far more easier, having some control of the breath, control of the prana. By then we get, by that, that way we can get control of the mind, which we are looking for. Looking for. This is pranayama. Prana means life force, yama means control. Life force control. That is pranayama, which is the basis of scientific meditation technique. We, we control our prana so that eventually we get control of the breath and control of the mind. Then we experience that. In that stillness we experience the existence of divinity within, which is always joyful, full of bliss, full of love and wisdom. That one. So there is science. There is science. In particular, uh, there is one meditation technique called Kriya Yoga. In this Kriya Yoga, it involves a sp special breathing. We take a special breathing through which excess oxygen is drawn inside. This excess oxygen decarbonizes the system and the, that venous blood is purified directly. When it is done, heart takes rest. Because it, was the it is the purpose of heart is to pump the impure blood into lungs and get it purified and pumped back, purified blood. So this is done directly by excess oxygen, giving rest to heart and lungs and slowing down the blood circulation and life force control is achieved through that. Senses are subdued. So that scientifically we get that concentration. This is Kriya Yoga, which is taught by Paramahansa Yoganandji. And uh, before he left his body, he compiled these teachings in the form of lessons, what we call Yoga Satsanga lessons. So these lessons give information. For instance, uh, how to meditate. It starts how to sit, where to put the hands, where to put the eyes, and then thought, how to control. If, like that, step by step, Scientifically, it's explained. 
these things are so scientific like 3 plus 4 equals 7 for Indians, Americans, Australians, Hindus, Muslims, Christians, young and old and men and women, these techniques are universal. They, they, don't, they don't belong to one particular religion. That is why the followers of Paramahamsa Yogananda are spread all over the globe. There are something like 600 meditation centers all over the globe. And all, people from all religions follow this because this is scientific doesn't depend on in your faith, because it's science. These lessons explain how to meditate, starting from beginning. Not only that, they also give other principles, how to live principles, which give us a balanced development of body, mind, and soul. Balanced development will be achieved. For instance, there is a lesson who says, yoga method for developing memory. How to improve our memory. There is a lesson which says how to get along with others. And here is a lesson, how to find and succeed in our life's vocation. How to choose your vocation. How to succeed in that. Health principles. And dietary suggestions. How to develop willpower. The power of initiative. All these principles are also explained in this, in this lessons. And of course, metaphysical things like you and your creator, relationship between this universe and yourself. These are also explained. So the various lessons that are required in our day-to-day -day life are given here. So anyone interested may subscribe for these lessons. They can get them and practice the principles. If you have any doubt, of course, we are here. You can contact us to clarify your doubts through emails or telephone calls or personal visits or whatever. So, these are some of the points I would like to share with you, mainly explaining the scientific principle behind meditation and its efficacy in our daily life. And availability of a particular meditation technique, that's Kiri Yoga technique, through our organization, Yoga Satsang Society through these lessons. Next, we have two options. One is, I can lead a short guided meditation where all of us can participate. That is one. Afterwards, we can have some question answer session. Or if you are interested, it's becoming too heavy. Right away, we'd like to have some question answer session. And then later, we'll have guided meditation. It's up to you. I leave it to the organizer, organizers to decide. I'm prepared either way. Suggest you go for meditation. We will take the question answer later on. Okay. Thank you. We'll do that. Okay. Now, I would like to have a short meditation session, guided meditation session. The purpose is this, to get a glimpse of meditation. Not that we are going to learn all about meditation. For more effective and advanced techniques of meditation, you write to us and you can learn through the lessons. But here I will get a glimpse of it. By this, hopefully, you get, everyone gets convinced that meditation is doable. I too can do it. I too can be benefited. I mean, that's the purpose. Not that entire meditation we're going to learn today. No. Just a glimpse. Okay. Some components of meditation. There are three, four components which I would like to share with you here. Uh, one is posture. Next, tensing and relaxing. Then some simple preliminary breathing exercise. Then some meditation technique, which is also basic. Then visualization and affirmation. These are the six comp components I would like to explain. One is posture. Posture for meditation, there are only two points are important. One is spine has to be straight. No? A, a bent spine is not effective for meditation. Spine has to be straight. Because so much happens in the spine, 
in its chakras and sahasrara, so much is happening. We don't need to know all that, but enough to keep the spine straight. You have to keep checking while practicing your meditation. Every and every day to make sure it's straight. Second point is gaze at Kutastha. This is the point of concentration in the body. This is the transmitting station to infinity. And heart is the receiving station. So our gaze should be either focused here or if you cannot focus here, at least focus up. Both, both eyes have to be up. Because if the eyes are level, that is Jagrata Avastha, wakeful state. Thoughts dominate. Thoughts keep coming. If eyes go down, that is subconscious state, we go to sleep. Even sleeping in meditation posture, we may be sleeping. If eyes, eyeballs go down, if eyeballs are up, both are up like this, then that is super conscious state, spiritual state. So in meditation, it's important to keep eyeballs up. Spine straight, eyeballs up. These are the only two points. Whether you sit on a chair or sit cross leg on floor, it doesn't matter. And a chair like this is okay. Spine straight, gaze upwards, and hands preferably upturned at the junction where thighs join the trunk here. So if you put this, chest opens up. That is, this is the posture. Eyes up. And close the eyelids are half open. Spine straight, gaze upwards. These are the, this is the, these are the two important points. Next, tensing and relaxing. See, meditation is all about pranayama to start with, before we find that unity with our real self. And life force control, pranayama, for that life force should be flowing free. Generally, body is full of knots, which constricts the flow of life force. For that, we tense and relax so that body, that the knots are removed and there is free flow of life energy. It's like this, with a deep, with a deep breath, I tense the whole body making fists like this, almost to the point of shaking, and then relax while exhaling through the mouth. The whole body tensed with deep inhalation through the nose and relax the body through the exhalation. That way the whole body gets you know, rejuvenated. The knots are removed. That's the second component. Third component is some kind of preliminary breathing. Remember, mind control comes from breath, some control of breathing also. That's what our ancient seers found out. There's relationship between mind and breath. Here we have a preliminary, very preliminary here. We take the breath through the nose, controlled breath, to a count of X, let's say 10. And then hold the breath to the same count of 10. Then exhale through the mouth to the same count of X. 10, 10, 10, or 15, 15, 15, or 6, 6, 6, whichever is comfortable to you. Take the breath, hold the breath to the same duration, and release with the mouth to the same duration. X, X, X. That is third component. Fourth component is, I'm explaining now, then we'll do it together. Is we watch the natural flow of air into the body and out of the body. Essentially, we are watching the breath. Air is going in, air is coming out. Natural flow, I should not control. Just now we control. Control in a way we took the breath. We, ha we were holding it for some time and released it. This is controlled breathing. Next step, we observe the natural breathing. I would say natural flow of air. As if you are observing the inhalation, exhalation of somebody else. Like a baby sleeping on a cot. We know that air is going into his body, air is coming out of his body. Because his stomach, uh, the baby's stomach goes up and down. Similarly, you watch your own breath. Air is going in, air is coming out. Air is going in, air is coming out. You should not exercise any control. It may be shallow breath or rapid breath, doesn't matter. 
that's very important this is the main point today we observe for some duration this results that calmness this calmness of course in in a little advanced technique that we observe it with a particular mantra also which i am not going to deal with today with that it is even more effective quicker that attainment of calmness comes much quicker even observing the breath that's a preliminary step to have the control of breath and mind observing the breath is very important we'll do it then comes visualization after that when some peace dawns some peace and happiness comes visualize it and expand that you are not limited to this physical body that joy is expanding all over the universe that visualization then you feel that expansion of your consciousness you are not limited to this mortal body which we are not actually we are not this just mortal bodies we are much beyond this that we expand known as visualization if you have time per if time permits we'll do that and then last is affirmation affirmation is very scientific very useful this is required for all of us whether we meditate regularly or not only thing is affirmations are very effective to do after meditation say positive thoughts positive words have a very beneficial effect on us if we repeat positive words again and again with deep attention and faith both with deep attention what you are repeating you should know you should feel the meaning behind the words with deep attention and faith they slowly but surely percolate into a subconsciousness and then remove any thoughts of fear and apprehensions that may be there in the subconsciousness it is, for many of us that's a problem we apprehend we fear without our knowledge they are they are seated because of some experience in the past experiences you know so that will be removed by positive the affirmations of words and if we still persist go and these thoughts will go further deep deeper than subconsciousness even super conscious state and bring out very amazing positive results in our life scientifically they work actually it's proven affirmations for example i'll just suggest one affirmation after the meditation we may affirm something like this i will meet everybody and every person on the battlefield of life with the courage of a hero and the smile of a conqueror you know this is may look like poetry no they can have tremendous effect on us slowly if you keep on repeating especially after a period of meditation i will meet everybody and every circumstance on the battlefield of life with the courage of a hero and the smile of a conqueror repeat aloud for some time then mentally and then aloud and then softly and then a whisper and then mentally like that we go on impress these words on that another affirmation could be joy is my birthright i will attain that joy by meditation no matter what i will always be joyful repeat it again no matter what i will always be joyful because joy is my birthright you you believe in these words and put your attention and repeat again and again they, they remove those negative thoughts are seated strongly in subconscious state but these are the five components now we'll practice together first is posture next tense and relax third preliminary breathing exercise next watching the breath next visualization and affirmation okay now let's all practice together i will be just guiding but you focus on the and what you are doing take a posture spine straight hands and thigh junction close your eyes first lift your eyeballs look up and close the eyes body should be relaxed no tension in the body but 
eyes are upwards. Initially, it may take some time, but very key for success in meditation is eyeballs up. Okay. Body relaxed, spine straight, gaze upwards. Now, take a deep breath through the nose. Tense the whole body. Make fists. Whole body. Feet also should be tensed. Whole body is tensed to a point of almost shaking. Now exhale through the mouth and ex uh, relax the body. Once again, take the breath through the nose. Tense the whole body. Exhale through the mouth and relax. Once again. Exhale. Last time. In the tension, remain for three seconds. Exhale through the mouth. Now, take the breath through the nose slowly. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Hold. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. Now exhale through the mouth. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. Now inhale. Hold. Exhale through the mouth. Inhale through the nose. Hold. Exhale through the mouth. Inhale through the nose. Hold. Exhale through the mouth. Now just watch the flow of air. Air is going in, air is coming out. This is the main point in today's meditation. Watch the flow of air. You should not control in any way. Don't make it short or long, as if somebody else's body. Air is going into your body, air is coming out of your body. Mentally check your posture, spine straight, eyeball supports. Hands preferably at the thigh junction. Air is going in, air is coming out.
air is going in, air is coming out. You are only a witness, Sakshi Bhava. You are a Sakshi, witness. Air is going in, air is coming out. Spine straight, gaze upwards. The entire focus is on the flow of air into the body, out of the body. Focus should be at the point between the two eyebrows. That's where you keep looking with eyelids closed. Position of the eyes, the point between the eyebrows, attention of the mind and the flow of air. Air is going in, air is coming out. Spine straight, gaze upwards. Mind and the flow of air.
Now, if you feel some joy, any peace, in the eyes, between the eyebrows, expand that peace in, throughout the body. You are surrounded by the peace in all directions. Beyond the body, the peace goes into the room, room, room where you are staying. Goes beyond the room. Entire campus. Entire town. Entire state. Peace expands throughout the country. Throughout the globe. Peace everywhere. I am the center of that peace. Now, we'll take an affirmation. Repeat after me. First loudly, then softly, then in a whisper, then finally mentally. Repeat after me. I will meet everybody and every circumstance on the battlefield of life with the courage of a hero and the smile of a conqueror. I will meet everybody and every circumstance on the battlefield of life with the courage of a hero and the smile of a conqueror. I will meet everybody and every circumstance and the battlefield of life with the courage of a hero and the smile of a conqueror. Now softly, I will meet everybody and every circumstance and the battlefield of life with the courage of a hero and the smile of a conqueror. I will meet everybody and every circumstance and the battlefield of life with the courage of a hero and the smile of a conqueror. Feel the meaning. Have faith in your own words. Pay attention. I will meet everybody and every circumstance on the battlefield of life with the courage of a hero and the smile of a conqueror. Now, in a whisper, I will meet everybody and every circumstance on the battlefield of life with the courage of a hero and the smile of a conqueror. I will meet everybody and every circumstance on the battlefield of life the courage of a hero and the smile of a conqueror. I will meet everybody and every circumstance and the battlefield of life with the courage of a hero and the smile of a conqueror. Then repeat mentally. Feel the meaning behind the words.
mentally repeat. Feel the meaning. Spine straight, gaze at Kutastha, gaze upwards, body relaxed. Then forget about visualization, forget about the affirmation, just look upwards and feel the peace. We will conclude here our guided meditation. At least, if we do for about 20 minutes at a stretch without interruptions, like I have been interrupting with my instructions, then it would be effective. Now, for those who would like to have a little more information on this, next one minute or so, we'll project a slide giving the details of the lessons, the lessons which I have shown you. Those who are interested can. Now we can go into question and session if people are still interested and if there is time. Yeah, now to the question answer. Before that, the topic that was covered by Swamiji, who is from our own fraternity, that is how to live a per perpetual joy life, life free of fear is the single most uh, thing which defines our existence on, our, on this earth. We are here to be happy, joyful, and in constant search of that. But happiness is like a mirage. Till the last breath, many of us still figuring out how to get figure it out. Around us, there are so many material advancement in technology, and so many material comforts, but today, despite our computers, cellular phones, technology, satellite television, people are even more, uh, have more anxiety, depressions than ever before in history. So thank you, Swamiji, for enlightening us on this very important topic of our day-to-day -day life. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, Swamiji, as if I have heard you correctly, that you worked with HAL Hyderabad. I had also worked for a brief period, about four years with HAL Hyderabad in the Avionics Design Bureau, AVDB3. That was long back in late 70s, early 80s. Now, before we go into, of course, there are several questions, but many of them have already been answered by you, especially through this practice of yoga. Uh, meditation, several of these questions, how to meditate, how not to sleep, 
what should be the posture, what is the, you know, <clears throat> how to control the mind, relationship between mind and breathing, they've all have already been answered by. Right. But before I go to, I'll still ask some questions. I have few from my side. Sir, can you, Swamiji, can you narrate an incident in your life that led you to take this path in life? At what point in your journey did you get this trigger? First thing, it seems to your colleagues at Hyderabad. I was there in 1980. You were also there at that time. Yes, sir. I was very much there. That AVDB. Yeah, I was also in AVDB too. Okay. okay. I was in uh, that's, that is different. Um, okay. And what incident? It's not one incident, I would say. Um, okay, let me tell you how it all started. When I was uh, studying at IIT Karakpur, I approached someone and asked, I would like to learn meditation, please teach me. Then immediately the question came, why do you want to learn meditation? See, I, I was not interested in God. I mean, to sit down, I, I, there is belief in God, that is different. But sit down and meditate on God, to spend time on God, that wasn't my priority at all. You know, God is there for children before exams. You know, God is there for elders before going to hospitals. You know, that was the role I gave to God. So here, uh, when he asked, I said, I want, I heard that meditation improves concentration. I want concentration in my research work, so I want to learn. Then he said, fine, uh, definitely meditation improve, deepens our concentration, but you have to be sincere and you have to be regular. You have to give 20 minutes in the morning, 20 minutes in the evening regularly. This was in 1979. I said, okay, 20 minutes is fine. 20 minutes, uh, that, mu that much I can give. But if I knew at that time, pretty soon I was going to spend longer than 20 minutes in meditation, I would have never started meditation in this life. Because uh, it's not a priority. I have so many other things to do. Longer than 20 minutes is, is too much. But okay, 20 minutes, fine. Then I learned Hangsa technique. It's known as Hangsa technique of concentration. But for me, it's much, much, much beyond concentration. Concentration is a byproduct. Uh, the title itself is Sangsa Technique of Concentration. It comes in lesson number four here. I learned it right away, started practicing. But generally, I'm focused. When I take up something, I do it sincerely. You know, with all my sincerity, I was doing 20 minutes in the morning, 20 minutes in the evening. Regularly, I was doing it. Then, pretty soon, by his grace, I, I was convinced of the existence of inner joy and the possibility of contacting the joy on a regular basis. Now, earlier, joy was not something unknown to me. I was joyful on many occasions. For many reasons, I was to be joyful. But this one, I, that joy was unconditional. It, it was inside. That is something I tasted personally, <clears throat> which I was never, never aware. All the time I was thinking that for me to be joyful, I had to do something. Something should happen, <coughs> excuse me, externally. But this just meditation, 20 minutes meditation, so joy. I mean, I, I was, it was captivating. Then 20 minutes became, 30 minutes became, 40 minutes on its own. Uh, on its own. Then I, I was enjoying it. Then I added other meditation techniques with addition to Hangsa technique, Om technique of meditation, then Kriya Yoga. I added, I was, it's quick, quickly I could go into that interiorization and enjoy that peace. So, the, but still I was continuing. I was working. I left IIT Kharagpur, then joined HIL. Later I went to Siddha Engineering College, then I went to Canada. Again, Usman I was like that. I was working, but all along pursuing it. But then thought came to me, I, I could enjoy so much, I could learn so much. Then how did I do this? That's because an ashram helped me to learn this. Ashram doesn't mean buildings, trees, and lawns, and mandirs. Ashram means ashramites. There are some ashramites who helped me. Maybe I could be a part of that, to help share the knowledge with others. That's how I, 
I changed. I, I went to the ashram, joined the ashram in 1985. So, along for six years or so, I worked out in the world before I joined the ashram. So, even if I didn't join the ashram, I would have continued with this. It is just that conditions were favorable, family conditions, other conditions were favorable for me to live my regular life and take up monastic life. Does that answer your question? Yes, sir. Now, slightly, you know, away from this topic, maybe, you know, of course, related. Guruji, around us, there are so many miseries caused by natural disturbances, like, uh, you know, people get agitated, disturbed, for example, too much heat, too much cold, recent earthquake in Syria and Turkey. Uh, so, do you believe that the Mother Earth responds to the karmic behavior of human society, sir? Any comment from your side on this? That's a much deeper, uh, deeper subject to comment on in a short time. And nothing happens arbitrarily, definitely. Even, see, some, some substance of my own life, as anyone else, is the result of my actions, my thoughts. Similarly, even, even this universe, the atmosphere, is affected by our thoughts, mass. Thoughts of the mass of people. And these are responsible. Our negative thoughts, thoughts of hatred, thoughts of greed, thoughts of this, that, you know, all these things affect, sometimes they result in natural cataphrase. And we can fight them by generating the positive thoughts. Positive thoughts. Yes. Thank you, sir. Not arbitrarily happening. There are several questions. I'll take few of them. Many of them have already been answered by you. So, question. How to be positive with so much negativity and suffering around me and in me? Should I become ignorant? See, I, I would like to address this like this. There, there, there is enough reason to be unhappy. Events are there. Negative things are there. And we do whatever bit we can to reduce this, mitigate this. In our, I, have some, I have some control over the events around me where I can take care. But what is more in, in my control is developing the positive attitude and trying to tap that joy. And when I am joy, I ex exude that joy, that, that distribute that joy. Even if I don't wantly do it, people are affected with, with each other. You know, when we meet, oh, this person is a very peaceful person. This person is so restless. Like that we feel sometimes. So le let us cultivate that, that life of calmness that joy let's cultivate and do whatever we could do to mitigate the problems around. That is more important rather than concentrating on the negative things, how to go about it, develop positive things, develop that joy inside you. That is possible through meditation. You do this. And at the same time, we are not, we are not going to be negligent of the events around us. Sometimes I'm required to step in and do something. I keep doing it also. So both ways, try to reduce this to the extent possible, but more importantly, cultivate this positive qualities. So vibrations you generate, positive vibrations. That is important. Yes, thank you. Question from Santanu. Namaste Guruji. How does nurturing the soul improve intuition and what is the importance of in intuition? <clears throat> See, intuition, Sanskrit word is agaman. Something comes on its own, not logically, because of this, 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 we lead to this inference. No, we go to that conclusion. That is logically, mind takes us there. Intuition comes on its own, just flashes, because that is the highest faculty of, of man. And that is a faculty of the soul. It doesn't come from this body. Intuition doesn't come from the mind, it comes from the soul. And meditation is the food for the soul. Through meditation, we are nurturing the soul in addition to body and mind. So when body, that soul gets its nourishment, you know, soul qualities are expressed. They come through us. That intuition, creativity, and that perfect love we all wanting to experience. And that unconditional joy, no matter what's happening around, inside I should be joyful. 
So all these things, these quality, these come from soul. As we are nurturing it through meditation, these come to get manifested in our life. So it does happen. Intuition gets manifested in our life. Question from Bal Subramaniam. Namaste Guruji, will constant meditation help in improving our physical health as we grow older? Or do we need to do some physical exercises to stay fit? Definitely. Definitely. It has a positive effect. In our health also improves, improves. At the same time, we should not be fanatics. Saying that now I am meditating, I don't have to take care of any medicine for my diabetes or uh, hypertension or whatever, leg problem, this problem, whatever it is. No, we should continue with whatever remedial measures we have. But definitely meditation helps us, helps us to fight these bodily problems too. But let's not be fanatics. We are not advanced so much that with mind alone we'll be able to cure the bodily ailments. We are not advanced so, so much as of now. So medication, meditation plus medication is more effective. As we are meditating more and more, probably the medication gets reduced. But doesn't mean that you don't have to take medication. It doesn't mean that you don't have to do exercise. And let me tell you one more thing. Uh, the, the practices I have from the beginning, we have four techniques we do every day. In addition to you know, um, Kriya Yoga, we also have warm technique of meditation and Hangsa technique of concentration. When we do this, not only concentration improves, more importantly for me, that existence of inner joy that we can experience. Before we sit down and practice these techniques of meditation, we have energization exercises. Energization exercises means we energize the whole body. And body becomes more conducive for meditation also. You see, during the day, as we are working, thinking, energy gets drained of the body. Like a body gets discharged. Like a battery gets discharged. Battery we recharge. Here, here also we recharge the body by using willpower. There are 38 simple energization exercises, which we do every day morning, evening. 38 exercises take only 15 minutes, one five, 15 minutes. That we do every day. That improves physical health also. Okay, I'll just demonstrate one. All of us, you know, sit straight like this. And you tense the whole, uh, both arms from, how means from uh, shoulder to fingers, both. Tense, making fist. Whenever we are tensing forearm, we have to make fist like this. Tense, almost to the point of shaking. Under tension, bring the hands up like this. Can you see me? Bring it up, almost shaking. Now relax, completely relax. Then tense, under tension, take the hands down. Under tension, hands must be shaking almost. Fully under tension. Now relax. Feel the relaxation. Now let's do once again, then I'll explain the principle. Tense. Take the hands up. Relax. Tense. Bring the hands down. Under tension. Now, what did you do? You did weightlifting. You have done weightlifting without weights. How could you do that? Willpower. You used the willpower and created the tension which comes when we are lifting the weights. Without weights, you could create that because your willpower is strong enough. No? And this is what we do. Like this got exercise now. Muscles get built. No, that muscle wasting is gone, we tense. And like that we have all body parts, including even scalp, scalp major, from there to toes, all body parts. We have a variety of exercises, sometimes with some special breathing. 38 exercises are there to energize this body in 15 minutes, just one five, 15 minutes, suitable for young and old, men and women, for everyone. So that means, there is an element of 
physical culture also. That means we have to take care of the bodies. Just because we are meditating means we don't need exercise. No. That also is required. We have, that is a part of our system. Does that answer your question? Yes, sir. So there are several questions how to meditate correctly, which you have already shown and answered. One question is, what is the connection between the yoga and consciousness? Uh, the, what do you mean by difference? Yoga means literally union. Literal meaning of yoga means union. It, it implies that union of this little self with the infinite spirit. Infinite spirit. The cre our, we, are so, we are come from that creation, creator. So little self merges with that. That is yoga. When we get connection, union with our infinite source, then everything comes physical health, mental harmony, and the spiritual knowledge, all this follow, follow when we, have, we are in touch with our infinite source. This is yoga. The uh, yoga techniques take us to that union. That is one thing. Consciousness is chit. Consciousness is an aggregate of mind, thought pattern, life force, everything. It's, it's a complex, that one. So that gets expansion in the process. It gets expanded. We expand our consciousness, we say, you know. Otherwise, my consciousness is limited to this body. Whatever happens in this body, I can immediately know because my consciousness is spread throughout this body. That gets expanded. That gets expanded. It's too complex. For now, that may be enough. There's a question from Gautam Khanna as well as from a few others. Thank you, Swamiji. Sometimes during meditation, random thoughts come during silence period about unrelated events or thoughts of the past. I do not know why that thought comes. Can you help us to understand and how to stop that? Uh, the first question is not important. Second question is important. How to stop that? Yes. We don't have to understand. We have to understand because just a memory. In the past, something happened that you are just recalling, that's all. You may not be interested in it, but still they come. Because one thought leads to another thought, another thought like that, you know. It is a chain of thoughts. Yes, meditation helps to subdue these thoughts. These thoughts slowly, slowly, they, that is why we are meditating. That's why we practice Hangsa. Then we practice Om technique of meditation, then Kriya. When you are doing it, our consciousness, our attention, interest goes more and more inside inside the spine, inside, in, inside the system, then these things take, you know, background, backseat. But it's a struggle. It's a struggle. Initially, thoughts are going to be there. But go on practicing, go on practicing. Bring the mind back to the what we are doing, watching the breath. Keep watching the breath, uttering the mantra, etc. And then slowly, slowly, they, they go down. It's not that from day one we are going to uh, throw all the thoughts out as soon as we sit in meditation. No, it's a process. And that will be there in after 10 years of meditation. But how does it matter? How does it matter? As you are improving, going, you are focusing here in that interiorization, these thoughts fall away slowly, slowly, slowly. No, it's like this. Ocean, if you go to ocean, there is a vastness of calm sea. No, sea is so vast, it's so calm. But to get that point of calmness in the sea, you have to wade through the waves. And the edge of the uh, ocean, where you start your journey, is not calm. Very turbulent, so many waves. Through this, you have to go. You have to somehow find your way, go beyond. Once you cross this, then you have that vastness of silence. The stillness is there. Similarly, thoughts at some point subdue completely. But initially, it's a struggle. It's a struggle. We have to. So, key is regularly we have to meditate. Slowly, slowly, if you are doing it, these thoughts subdue. On meditation, there's one comment or question that I have always meditated by focusing on the edge of my nose. But today I learned it should be up. You know, is do, do I need it, to? When, this is what uh, our system teaches, Nashikagra. That means this is the edge for we, we focus. If someone teaches this, then we, I have no comments. 
this is the one see while focusing here automatically eyeballs go up that is super conscious state if you are if they are level jagratavast thoughts dominate if eyeballs go down while looking here then it's subconscious state one is likely to go into past memory thoughts and even sleep so we always do it here this one i can't comment this is not something which i do so i have no comments on that we concentrate here now one question on what really happens to brain during meditation of course you have answered that but <laughs> yeah yeah thoughts get subdued and there is there is absolute stillness where the chitta vritti nirodha i mean that that uh, cessation of this mind stuff cessation of this alternating waves that go into our consciousness in the brain and mind whatever ripples are there in the mind and brain this the cessation they are get worked out all these ripples so brain also is quiet yeah i'll take two, two three more questions if i have sir guru ji your permission uh, how does a complete novice who has never done meditation get started on this path and control his mind yes that what i did it years back 20 minutes of meditation in the morning and 20 minutes in the evening the hangsa technique which i learned in lesson 4 subscribe for the lessons these lessons come every two weeks let us say two lessons in a month very first first lesson itself gives how to sit how to practice in second month we get how to do this japa also that hangsa technique of concentration so that's how we start just subscribe for lessons you take the lessons digital lessons are there as well as hard copies read and practice and once you start practicing you may have questions genuinely then you contact us on phone email or personally then we are here to help you that's how we start the question how do we retain the joy that we get during meditation in our day to day life throughout the day yes the, the conscious effort should be there to hold on to that it's again yes it it's very likely that whatever we gain in meditation we go with that slowly slowly that may fade out because of the external influences that's why we again we meditate in the evening again we get that but we as we progress along as we go along then more and more time we will be holding on to this joy and less and less affected by external world but that's going to be there it's not going to be a miracle once i start meditation even if i start enjoying i will be like joyful throughout it's not a miracle it's it's effort retain that related question uh, how many times how long any specific time for meditation during the day no we advise to meditate twice a day no specific time any time in the morning one, once in the morning once in the evening before food or after food once convenience uh, need not be at the same time every day so but twice a day and last question how to manage work life balance and stretch stress at work and uh, definitely you know definitely we get that guidance see stress is there definitely there are so many so many things are happening so many even for us even for us even, although i am i'm a sanyasi um, externally i have renounced my work my profession a different profession uh, but even here i am busy i have responsibilities you may not imagine from 1989 to 1991 two years i was one of my responsibility was to write computer programs in database that was 30 years back i wrote two years it took for me to complete our um, up computerizer operations that program which took the, it served for 25 years in 2015 we changed to some other uh, program but see even i am i am busy with that now i have different uh, responsibilities work life balance means it all starts giving some time to meditation see out of 24 hours see apart from sleep and other things about 8 hours 10 hours or even little more some we give to work and we also give to work but other times find some work some time if not ha ha half an hour one hour in the morning one hour or half an hour in the evening do that that is how once you find you make up your mind then that gives us the strength to face the life there is no way we are going to be relieved of our responsibilities 
we have to work that 8 hours, 10 hours in our profession and then family responsibilities. In addition to all that, just give time, then you get that guidance, you get that confidence and strength to face life. Thank you, Guruji. Thank you for inviting uh, one, one thing I would like to mention that you repeatedly use the word Guruji. I am not Guruji. You can say I am a Swami. Swami. Our Guru, Guruji is only one person that performs Yogananji. We are just his instruments. Someone, because he doesn't have a body, somebody else has to speak are, on his behalf. You are our Guruji. <laughs> no, no, no. Guruji is one. I am a Swami. That's all. <laughs> Swamiji, thank, thank you very much for enlightening us on this topic, how to live in a perpetual joy. You taught us the correct way of doing meditation. A lot of doubts that were there in our mind that have, that have been cleared today. You know, joyness uh, is, along with other emotions, is just a kind of chemistry. And you have taught us the technology, how we can create the kind of chemistry that we want within ourselves. Uh, so thank you, uh, Swamiji, for enlightening us. And with this, I hand it over to Devashish Bhattacharya for his word of thanks. Thank you very much. It has been a pleasure to have Swamiji with us and listening to him. I think it has been always a quest for mankind, all of us, to try and figure out what is it that is there beyond life. Before I even start thanking Swamiji, I think Swamiji's being here has been made possible through his Guru, Sri Sri Yogananda Ji. And finally, if we reach out to the source, Lahiri Mahashaya. So starting with him, we are now at a stage where there are practitioners of Kriya Yoga who are able to enrich the lives of many. Thank you, Swamiji, for you and all the organizers from your side who came in and made today's event possible. We look forward to interacting with you, and I think many of us have got to understand, got a glimpse of that particular world which each one of us is searching for. Thank you very, very much. Thank you, Alokanandji, and thank you, all other uh, friends and supporters from uh, Yogada Satsanga Society who helped make this happen. The thought came to us first from our secretary, Pradeep Bhargav. He initiated this discussion. Normally, as a society of engineers, we discuss everything that has to do with technology and applications of technology. So suddenly, moving into an inner engineering kind of a thing, for want of a better word, I would like to thank Pradeep for making this happen. Thank you very much, Pradeep. I would like to thank all the people who took a very important period out of their Saturdays, which they would like to go meet friends, do various other things, but they came here to join, listen to Swamiji and gain something which they would carry back. Thank you very much, friends. Because you are present, we are energized to create and make these events. It gives us happiness and we are happy to feel that you also got something out of it. Sunil Khanna ji is our senior and one of the most enthusiastic persons in all pursuits that we do. Thank you, Sunil ji, for conducting uh, the conversation with Swami ji. And possibly amongst all of us, you are the best suited for, for this particular part. I would be amiss if I do not thank Padmini Padhi, who is possibly our most strained or constrained person in the whole thing, anything that we think of, it falls upon Padmini to execute it and she is the one who takes up all, all the load from everywhere. So maybe Padmini can connect with Yogoda Satsang and learn the techniques and, and make her life less stressful. Thank you very much Padmini for being there. It has been a pleasure Swamiji. We look forward to interacting with Yogoda Satsanga Society uh, in, in the years to come. Thank you very, very much for your time. Thank you very much. Namaskar. Namaskar. Okay, Padmini, can you please uh, share the YouTube link so that it can be posted now? You are muted, Padmini. Oh, I, I'll, I'll just put, post it in the chat. Okay. So all, all the people thank who are there with us, thank you very much. Please feel free to write to us with your suggestions on what else we can do and we'll try and make those things happen. Thank you, sir. Thank you, everybody. Good day to all of you.
थैंक यू एवरीवन